that you've given us for all the people in our lives, Father. Lord, for the jobs that we have, Lord, just for the sunshine, for the rain, Father. We thank you for all these things. Lord, right now I pray that I would just step back and that you would step forward, Father. That we'd hear from you because we need to hear from you. Lord, I pray that the words that you give us today wouldn't just go on one ear and out the other, Father, but that they would change our lives, that they would penetrate our hearts, Father, so that we can be better people for you, so that we can be better people for our families, Father. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't leave these doors the same way we walked through them this morning, Father. Lord, we all pray this in your name. We all said, amen, amen. So I want to start out with a question. Um, and this question is this, is what would you do if you knew back then what you know now, right? If you knew back then what you know now, how would your life be different, right? For, for some of us, if it was this thing of, you know what, if I knew back then, I would have invested in Amazon, right? Before Amazon blew up, right? For some of us, if I knew then what I knew now, I wouldn't be so worried about never, ever having a girlfriend or never, ever being married, right? Because, hey, we're here now, right? Some of us, uh, what about, like, these crazy hairstyles, the girls with the crazy poofs, right? You look at these old pictures, and you're like, what was I thinking? How many of you guys wore parachute pants? Come on. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Right? All these things where you're like, man, looking back, if I, what was I thinking, right? If I knew then what I knew now, things might look a little bit different right? We would have invested in stuff, and people are kicking themselves for the uh, uh, never investing in Apple, things like that. I'm, I'm a big car guy, right? So the very first car I ever had was, uh, what was it, like a 69 Volkswagen Squareback, which was a Volkswagen station wagon. I love that car. If I knew that, it would be so hard to find one these days, I would have never got rid of it. We had a 35 Chevy with four doors. I mean, all kinds of stuff like that, man. If I knew now what I knew then, right? Or if I knew then what I know now, I would never got rid of it. I never got rid of it, man. But, you know, they always say hindsight is 2020, right? And as we're going through this series that's called Exponential, it's kind of what we're talking about. When we're talking about this, Pastor Craig said in the first week, um, and I think you guys have it in your notes, is... Uh, we're cons we, we start to think, we think that, we think in the addition, and God thinks in the multiplication. Oh, wrong note. So, when it comes to exponential, the things that we're talking about is when Jesus says, when those that are free are free indeed, right? True freedom. He talks about, if you give, test me in this, and I'll throw open the storehouses of heaven and bless your families, um, he's talking about when you have faith, if you have just faith of a mustard seed, if you could move mountains, right? He's talking about uh, how Jesus gave the most exponential gift to us, which was his entire life to save us, right? These things are things that the Bible talks about how we can have an exponential life. Like there's so much more than just enough. And it's hard for us because as Christians, we live just a normal life, right? We Okay, well, we prayed a little bit, and God answered this little prayer. Um, Lord, please, uh, I, I, I think I went through that light that flashed me a ticket. I have faith that I won't get that ticket, right? Little stuff like that, you know? And the Bible's telling us that we should think in exponential ways, not just in addition, but in multiplication. When we're thinking about being forgiven, we don't want to be forgiven for just a little bit. We want to be forgiven for a lot. We shouldn't just be giving a little bit. We should be giving a lot. We shouldn't be thinking in addition. We should be thinking in multiplication. And I think that one of the biggest reasons why we do this is, this is one of your first notes is this, is we're consumed by the temporary rather than focused on the eternal. We get sidetracked. We start thinking about the stuff that's right now, temporary stuff, right? Paying rent, making sure the car's working making sure we're doing enough for, for our jobs, making sure that, you know, we have nice clothes or, you know, purses or whatever it is that we tend to invest our money in. We start thinking about stuff here on this planet, but not for the future. If you've got your notes, the first scripture we're going to be reading is this one, and it's Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, and it says this. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above 
where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Right? So Jesus knew that this was going to be an issue for us. And he taught a parable, and it's all about this multiplication principle. And if you guys have your Bibles, I want you guys to open it up to Matthew 25. And if you don't, like we always do here, we'll put the scriptures up for you guys. And some of you guys are familiar with this story. How many of you guys remember the story of the, the three guys that the master leaves the talents to? We've kind of been talking about it with offering, right? So I want you guys to uh, remember this story, and I'm going to read it. And I want to put a little bit of emphasis on some of the words that maybe you didn't realize when you read this before. <coughs> so excuse me, because I'm not the best reader. But hopefully you guys are, so then there's no excuse. Okay, so chapter 14 says like this. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by, this is Jesus speaking, the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his, his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to what? Dividing it in proportion to what? To their abilities. Remember that. He left on his trip. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and he earned two more. The servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account on how they used his money. The servant to whom he entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to what? You gave me five bags of silver to what? And I have earned five more. And I want to pause right there real quick. Because when we read this story, sometimes we're like, oh, well, he just gave them the, the, the money. They didn't know what they were supposed to do. But right there, the guy says, you gave me this to invest. He gave it to him with a purpose. It wasn't just, here's five bags of silver. I'll see you in a little bit. Sometimes when we read that story, we read it like that. Okay? So we'll continue on. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to what? To invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant, gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid to lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and what? One more time. You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I had harvested crops that I do not plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. He then ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. And to those who use, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Let me read the last part again. But from those who what? No, no, no. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. I wanted to add that emphasis because a couple things, right? Number one, talent. People ask, what is a talent? What does talent mean? Right? Well, in the translation, talent actually was the English word that we receive our word, talent. So it means our gifts, means our time. A talent back in those days was also what they called money. So if you're asking, well, does talent mean money? Does talent mean gifts? Does talent mean my time, my, 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 my blessings? Yes, it does. It means all that. It means all those things. 
not just money. But what I want you guys to understand and what I want you guys to see is that sometimes when we read that, um, those scriptures and that story, have, how many of you guys ever felt bad for that last one? Right? We read that last one and we're like, oh man, poor guy. Why is they, why are they so mad at him? He was just afraid. I've been afraid. I, I may, Maybe I would have dug a hole because I, I don't want to take a chance, Right? We feel sorry for him because sometimes we see ourselves as that last guy. And we're like, well, maybe I would have played it safe in my life. I would have played, I, I, mean, I, could, I could see myself playing it safe and just chilling and burying the, the treasure, right? But see, when we read the stories, he said that he gave each of them according to their abilities, which means he knows what they're able to do, which means he knows what you're able to do he knows the gifts that we have so there's no excuse there's no lying and saying you know what god i don't have any talents you know what god i don't have enough money you know what god i don't have because he gave them according to their abilities so if you're broke and you're poor maybe that's all the abilities you've gained so far if you're rich and have a lot you have a lot of abilities but you got a lot of responsibilities but each one of us has an ability and each one of us has a set of talents that we are given so nobody in this room can say that they didn't have it because we've all been given according to what our abilities are number one number two at the end he says you wicked and lazy servant and that's a harsh one but that's a true one because a lot of times if you have a talent to sing or you have a talent to dance or you have a talent to lift something heavy or you have a talent to fix something or you have a, any kind of talent that you have and you're getting ready to use it and you're like ah, but it's too far if i if i if i had a sing i had to ask somebody i got to find a microphone you know, are they going to play the sound right and we just kind of lazy out if we got a talent to pray for people or, or be there for people we tend to be like, yeah, but I, it's, you know, I just got home and it's traffic, you know. And I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? A lot of times it's not so much just because we're afraid. A lot of times we're lazy. We don't want to get to work. And I think sometimes when we want to feel bad for that last guy, it's because we know that. We know we're able to. How do we know? Because we're singing in the shower. Right, sister? Singing in the shower, right? We know we have our talents. But sometimes we just don't want to use them. And sometimes, yes, we say it's afraid, but a lot of times we're just kind of lazy to cultivate it. You guys know what I'm talking about? But in this whole story, there's one part that I don't know if you guys caught, but in the very beginning, the very first sentence said this, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by. Then he says, this story. So Jesus is saying that this is what heaven is going to be like. Basically, the Bible has given us background information, future information, right? Hindsight's twenty twenty, but we have the Bible, and the Bible tells us exactly what we need. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? It's a blueprint on how to live our life exponentially on earth will translate what happens in heaven. Okay? Allowing us to know now what's happening is going to allow us to know what's going to happen in the future. So if you put your talents to work here on earth, and you put your talents to help people, and to pray for people, and to bring people to church, and to save people, that means that in heaven it's going to be multiplied. We're going to have more people saved. That's what the story is like. Some of us, our abilities are only allowed one bag of silver. Some of us two. Some of us five. So, yes, it's about giving and it's about money, but it's also about reaching people. It's about getting more people into heaven. It's about using these talents we have. And one thing that when, when we start to, to think about that eternally and saying, okay, well, it's not just about what's on this earth. It's about what goes to heaven. One thing that will help us, and, and I think this is when you know is here, is that God owns everything. God owns everything. And sometimes we get that mixed up because we think we're so smart, we're so good, that's why we have the jobs we have. 
We think we're so phenomenal at what we do. That's why we have what we have. We think we've earned it. We think we've worked for it. We think we saved for it. And the truth is, is that God's just giving you according to your abilities. He's blessing us. He's blessed us with what we have. Matthew 25, um, 14, remember it said like this. It said, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted them his money to them while he was gone. His money. Everything we have, everything in your pocket, everything in your purse, everything in your bank, everything in your house belongs to God. Right? When we die, we can't take any of it with us, right? You know, God wants us to understand that what we have is his. He created us to be generous the way he is. He created us to be givers the way he is. The problem is, is that when we start thinking that we've done it all or we own it all, it's almost impossible to let anything go. But when you start to realize that, you know what, it's his in the first place, it's easy to give it away. If I called you guys up here and I had 10 single dollar bills, which I don't, but if I had 10 single dollar bills and I said, I want you guys to go out and pick 10 people and give them a buck each. Oh, yeah, cool. Let me see. Who, who, who was nice to me? This guy was cool. This lady's always nice. She smells good. That guy kind of stinks. No, it's, good. it's easy, right? But if I said, okay, I want you guys, I'm going to pick somebody randomly, and I want you to give your $10 and pick out 10 people, it's a little bit harder. Because we think we own it. It's our money. Well, I'm fine giving away somebody else's money. But when it's mine, it's mine. I work hard for that $10. Right? And that's when it's hard for us to give it away. But when we realize that it's not ours to begin with, then it makes it easier to say, you know what, of course. Let me give you this time. Let me give you my talent, right? You know, I, I heard an interview with uh, the DC Talk guys and Michael Tate, is that his name? He said, we're not blessed because we're talented. We're talented because we're blessed. And sometimes we as people get it backwards. You guys know what I'm talking about? I think this is one of the reasons why God set up the tithe or the 10% the, the, the that he calls us to do. You know why that is? Because in your next note, it says this. The tithe is a declaration of God's ownership. It reminds us that that dollar and that money and that checking account and that job that we have doesn't belong to us. It reminds us that, hey, something else has to be done first. When we talk to, to our kids and we talk to our daughters about giving money when they have their jobs, you know, we'll give 10% first. I, I, I charge my kids rent. And they have jobs. Now, some people are like, why are you charging your kids rent? Because when they grow up, they're going to have to pay rent. Why would I not charge them rent? It helps them also to get used to knowing that when they get paid, it's not all just fun time. When I get paid, I have to do something first. I have to give my tithes first. I have to pay my rent next. I have to try and save some money third. And then whatever I have left, I can blow whatever I want. When you get that mindset from the beginning, it's easier to carry that through life. But some of us, we don't get that mindset early. You know, some of us were super spoiled kids. You can tell because you're super spoiled adults. I want what I want. I get whatever I want, and I want it right now, and I don't care what anybody says about anything. I need the best. I have the best. I want the best, and nobody can tell me nothing. And your poor husband and wife is just right there behind you, ragged. But sometimes we think that. But that tenth shows us that, you know what? No, it's not all about you. There's responsibilities first. This belongs to God. This is where it has to go first in order. Then pay your bills. Blow whatever else you want. Spend the rest on Slurpees if you want. But once your tithes are done, once your rent is paid and your bills are paid, then you can do the rest. And, and it helps us to learn that. Leviticus 27.30 says this. One-tenth of the produce of the land whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. Why 10%? Why 10? If I held up 10 fingers, just one. Just one. 
Why 10%? You know about the why 10%? Why 10%? 10%, I believe, is because it's a guideline. It gives us kind of a benchmark, right? And the reason, excuse me, why 10% and, and why these lines are hard is because some of us don't like the lines, right? Like I said, where we're told, hey, put this away first, then do this, then do this. We want to just have an open bucket, right? Pastor Wayne Cadero, he said this. He said, he said, there was a brother one time. He said he went to the therapist, and he said, uh, brother, we learned that you have a, an obsessive problem. And he says, what are you talking about? He said, well, he said, they, 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 your family wants you to come to me because they think, they think that you're obsessed. He says, ah, they're, they're crazy. He says, okay, let me do this. He goes, I'm going to show you, I'm going to draw a picture, and I want you to tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Said, All right. So he draws a straight line up and down. He said, what do you see? He said, oh, brother, that's a naked lady. That's a naked lady right there. And he says, oh, okay. He said, let me draw another picture. And he drew a line slanted like that. Now what do you see? Oh, brother, that's a naked lady falling down. That's a naked lady falling down. Oh, okay. Let me draw another one for you. And he drew a straight line like this. Now what do you see? Oh, that's a naked lady laying down. That's a naked lady. He said, you're totally obsessed with, like, sex and all this crazy stuff. And he said, me? You're the one drawing all the dirty pictures. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> Sometimes lines show us more about us than it does about anybody else. That guideline is a guideline set. And sometimes when we have a huge problem with the lines, it tells us more about us and our issues than it does about even how low or how high any kind of guidelines are set. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's a guideline. It gives us a starting point. It tells us that, you know what, everything belongs to God. You know, when we, when we were young Christians, we had a hard time struggling. Me and my wife, I say we, and even as a younger person, giving 10%. It was always, it was always tough, you know, because we would always get paid, and we would go grocery shopping, and pay our bills, and do all this, and do all that. Then, we would go to church on Sunday, and try and pay 10%, but we didn't have enough. Or we'd have enough, but that would be like, oh, well, now I won't be able to go to McDonald's, or I won't be able to pay for gas or something because we always paid it at the end. And it seemed like the more we never, ever paid tithes, no matter how much money we earned, no matter what we had in life, we never, ever had enough. We just, it was always paycheck to paycheck to paycheck, and we were always behind that eight ball, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. It was always like that. And then I remember I, 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 I read a little book. It was a little pamphlet, but one of those little Jesus bookstores, you know, a little, little pamphlet. And it said, give your tithe first. The Bible calls it first fruit for a reason. It's the first seed to go in the ground, which means it's the first seed to have the soil. It's the first seed to get the sun. It's the first seed to get wet. It's the first seed to get watered. It's the first seed. It's not the last one, because the last one gets the last planted, right? The last of the sun, the last of the water. So it gives you first fruits. When we started doing that, we started, when we would get paid, we would write a check right there before we'd spent anything. And it was easy. Because it's, it's funny, we ask people, no matter whether we make a lot or whether we make a little bit, we always make enough. So when we would give our tithes first, we always had enough. And not only that, God would bless us with even more. Always, always bless us with even more. We would give it first. Give it first, give it first, give it first. Then we would pay our bills. Then we would pay everything else. Because that gave priority to God over our responsibilities. That also put our faith in God over our faith in our own bank accounts and what we had. It put a, a reliance on God and a trust in God. And it also showed us that God, it belonged to God first. You know, later on in life, when we didn't have a lot of money, there was a lot of times in our lives when we, we just didn't have enough. You know, you guys know when uh, I tell you guys that my honey was pregnant. I don't even know with what kid. I had so many kids already. Fourth kid, I don't know. 
she was pregnant, and I had really, you know, I have uh, real bad diabetes, and I can't feel a lot on my feet. And uh, one of the kids, ghetto kids, they ruined my life. They, uh, they dropped a toothpick upstairs in the hallway, right? I don't, they don't even have teeth. What do they need toothpicks for? But anyways, they dropped a toothpick, and it was standing up in the carpet, and I was walking through barefoot, and they always say, you don't walk barefoot. And I stepped right on it, boom, right? <laughs> kind of like this. And it dug into my foot, and I picked it up, and I, I went to pull it out, and it snapped the tip off in my foot, right? Well, a few days later, that started to get infected, and I ended up having to go to the hospital, and they cut my foot open, and it took them like an hour worth of digging in there to even find it. I still have it at home, because not like it was a lucky toothpick, right? But it laid me out for so long, I couldn't go to work. And my honey was already like eight or nine months pregnant with the fourth kid, so she wasn't going to work. Nobody went to work. And no matter what, we never lost our house. People always came through, you know. My mom came through. Her mom came through. You guys came through. As you guys know, in December 2013, when I had my motorcycle accident, it was the craziest time in our life. You know, I was on life support for was it like 13 days. The hospital for a month, life support for another month, whatever. It was crazy. Couldn't go to work. Couldn't do nothing. But God provided a way. And our mortgage was paid. And my job kept paying me because of the job that God put me in way long before that. Was able to pay disability and all that stuff. And we might think of it as chance. But I know that it was God always working. You know, many of you guys here gave so much to us. God provided a way, and sometimes he uses us as that way. Many of you used your talents at that time to help us out. You guys know what I'm talking about? Everything belongs to God. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Everything belongs to God. Romans 11.36 says this, For everything comes from him and exists by his power, and is intended for his glory, all glory to him forever. Amen. <coughs> it's all God's. My entire life was God's. You know, I, I lived a life in, in, in faith saying, you know what, God, I'm faithful to you, and, and I believe in you, and I believe that you will always take care of everything for me, right? But I got to work hard to supply for my family. I know you'll take care of us, God, but I got to work, right? I know you'll take care of us, God, but I got to save. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's the way we're supposed to think. But until I'm laid on this hospital bed, right, with broken everything basically from the waist down, and his doctor is saying, okay, I'm going to put you to sleep for a little bit. And when you wake up, you'll be fixed. And I'm saying, you're going to put me to sleep for a little bit, and I don't know if I'm going to wake up. And that was a time where I had to say, you know what? How much faith do I have in God? How much faith do I have in my brothers and sisters that they will take care of my family when I can't? That's when we understand. And that's when we come to find out that, you know what? There is a God. And he takes care of things when we can't. And sometimes it takes him putting our backs to the wall to remind us that he is God. And I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. You know, I remember when Jesus was, was talking to, to the Pharisees, and uh, they said, well, we believe in Moses. We didn't know about you. And Jesus says, well, I knew Moses. And they said, well, how? You're not even 50 years old. How could you have known Moses? And Jesus says, because before Moses was born, I am. He didn't say I was. He didn't say I was there. Jesus says, before he was born, I am. That means there's no beginning. That means there's no end. And that is amazing for us. You know, what we need to understand 
And the question that I have for you is, how would your life change if you knew that everything belongs to God? How would your life change right now? If you knew that everything in your bank account was God's and the house that you go home to is God's and the job that you have is God's and, and the children that you have are God's and the relationship you have is God's. If everything that you have, how would your life change if you realized that everything belonged to God? For some of us, it's hard. For some of us, it's hard because we start to remember that if everything does belong to God, then we have to give an account for what we've done with everything that we have. Because just like the master gave us what we have and he went away for a while, when he comes back, he's going to ask us, what did you do with everything I gave you? And we have to give an account for that. Romans 14, 10 through 12 says this. So why do you condemn one another? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me. Every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to who? To God. And you say, but wait a minute, brother, does, doesn't, the, doesn't the Bible say that we're saved by grace? Yes, it does. But doesn't it say that there's no more judgment and condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus? Yes, it does. But we have to remember that there's two judgments. The first is the great white throne judgment, right? Where God judges who believes in God and who doesn't, right? But there's another judgment. And that judgment is where we have to make an account for what we've done in our lives. I tell parents all the time, your children are a gift to you from God. You will have to give an account for your children. So woe to you if you abuse your children. You're going to have to give an account for that partner God put in your life. So woe to you if you abuse your partner. We're going to have to give an account for all these things that God puts in our lives, right? We have to give an account for it. But, but, here's the, here's, here's the, I don't want to say here's the big but, but <laughs> here's the big but, right? <laughs> when we think of this judgment, we get so like, oh. Why? Because we think of judgment like God being an angry judge holding a gavel, right? He's, he's, he's strong and he's angry and he's mad at you for what you've done. And you better have a good reason for what you did and why you did it, right? But see, judgment isn't just like that. The judgment that's used in the Bible is also for the word that was used for the Olympians, right? When you'd have Olympians go and they, they do the Olympics, and, and when those guys would, would compete and the ones that would finish at the end, they would go and stand before a judgment seat. But see, their judgment wasn't a judge with the gavel. Their judgment was a judge saying, you did so good. You got bronze. And you know what? You did great, but you did even better. So you get silver. And man, you blew us all away because everything that you did, you deserve gold. You guys understand what I'm saying? It's also a judgment, and it's also you giving an account for what you've done, but it's not in a way of condemnation. It's in a way of God saying, you did that much more. And that's encouraging. Because none of us are expected to be perfect. But just like Olympians, you can practice more. You can invest more time. You can spend more time praying. You can spend more time doing all these things. You guys know what I'm talking about? And when we give an account like that, it's not like, tell me what bad you did. It's like, tell me what else good you did. And that is an encouraging place to be. Revelation. How many of you guys know what, what's the last book in the Bible? Revelation. And, and Pastor Joe always gets upset because it's revelation, not revelations. Because we're all kind of hood people. We always say revelations, right? It's revelation. <laughs> the revelation, right? The last book of the Bible is Revelation. 
And Revelation 22, 12 says this, Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. Last book of the Bible, that's what they're saying. That's what Jesus is saying. When you give an account, he's got his reward for you. It's not a, a I'm going to beat you over the head type of thing. So how would your life change knowing that we got to give an account for everything that God puts in our lives? We have to change the way that we think. We have to become faithful stewards with what God's given us. And you guys have there in your notes, here's, here's three points. The first one is this. We got to see ourselves as kingdom investors rather than earthly spenders. Kingdom investors versus earthly spenders. And as you guys see right there, the definition of, of spending is basically like trading, right? I give you $2, you give me a cheeseburger, whatever, right? <laughs> kind of trading back and forth, right? That's spending. Investing is saying, I'm going to put in $10, but I hope to gain 100 Exponential, not just add and multiply. When we invest, you don't, you don't invest into something to hope to get your money back. You invest in something hoping to get double, triple, whatever else more, right? That's the difference between spending and investing. You know, you see, you see right there, the definition of invest is to devote expecting exponential return. Exponential. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says this. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. That's what Pastor Joe was talking about. Wherever your monies go, wherever your talents go, wherever those things go, that shows you where your heart is. So every time we have an opportunity to use our talents, every day, every minute, every hour, it gives us an opportunity to show God that our heart is with him. To invest in time in godly things. Right? Instead of spending all our time watching Netflix because we spend and we just kind of veg out as what we get in return. You can invest in someone who's hurting. Instead of spending so much energy in trying to control your kids or control your relationship, you can invest time on your knees praying. You guys see the difference? There's a difference between spending and investing. And there's a difference between spending and investing on things on this earth, realizing that, hey, one day we're going to make it to heaven because that's our hope, right? We're saved. We're saved by grace. We're saved by what the cross did for us. So if we get to heaven, we want to make sure that when we get to heaven, that everything is exponential in there. How would your life look if you knew then what you know now? How many of us would have spent more time with those people that we lost, not knowing that they were going to be gone so fast? You know, when my brother passed away a year before my motorcycle accident, I didn't know it was going to be so fast. I didn't know he was going to go in the hospital one Saturday and be gone by the following Saturday. I didn't know that. If I would have known, trust me, things would have been different. When you guys lost someone, and you say, man, if I only would have known, I, I, was, I was just going to go visit them that weekend. I was just going to go pray for them. I was just going to go make up with them. I was just going to go forgive them. I was just going to try and, and beg them just, to, just, just for a little bit. How would our lives change if we knew that everything that we have belongs to God, including our time, including our marriages, including our money, including everything? You know, you guys hear all the stories all the time. When millionaires pass away, the last thing they say is, man, I wish I would have made more money. Nobody ever says that. See, I wish I would have had more time with my kids. I wish I would have spent more time on what was important. Because I spent all this time building all this up for what? For all of it to go away. Remember, you're a ten-talent person. You're not the one that got one bag of silver. 
You're not the one that with two. You're not the one that, that, that did. You're the one that did five and got ten back. Don't think of yourself as so small. We have lots of talent. Someone says lots of talents as well. Put them to good use. And what does your very last note say? The very last note says this. Put everything you have to good use and we'll hold nothing back. Leave it all, leave it all out there, right? You guys that play sports, when they, when, they, when they say, when you go out there, you don't know if you're gonna win, you don't know if you're gonna lose, but you know what, leave it all out there. Give it all you got. So I don't know about you, but I'm the kind of person that I, I, I hate, I, I hate to use the word hate, but I hate, <laughs> I hate to use the word hate. I hate walking away from a situation or a conversation where I'm like, man, I should have said this. Man, when they said, I, oh man, I should have been ready. But if we give it all, then you never walk away with regret. You say, you know what, I tried. I tried and I gave it all. And whether I succeed or I don't succeed, I know in my heart that I gave everything I got. And it's up to God to take the rest. That's exponential living. Instead of spending time here on earth and on things here, it's investing on godly things. So that we can have exponential growth in heaven. So that more of our brothers and more of our sisters can be there with us. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Right? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we come before you one more time. Just absolutely grateful, Father, for everything you've done and everything you've given us, Lord. I pray, Father, that we would, refoc we would refocus, Lord, our lives on the exponential things of heaven. And stop being so focused on things of this earth, Father. I pray, my God, that you would just teach us and show us, Father, and break these holes that we have, Father, on, on these earthly things. And that we would just let them go for you. I pray, Father, that you remind us of all the times that you brought us through the things that we thought we would never make it through, my God. But you showed up in a miraculous way. My God, I pray that you would just show us how to change our lives, my God. Not to live a life that's more contained, but to live a more life that's more free, Father, that we have more freedom in. Help us to take time to, to reach our brothers and our sisters here, Father. Help us to invest the, the time and the talents and the prayers and all the things that we have available to us. Help us to invest all those things, Father, in reaching all of our brothers and sisters. Because somebody somewhere did that for us, and I pray that we would do that for someone else. You don't bless us for us just to be happy, but you bless us so that we can bless others. Remind us of this and show us this, Father. We pray in your name. And we all said, Amen. Amen.